So thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion. Uh, I am Eugene Leventhal. I'm the operations lead here at the Smart Contract Research Forum, and we're excited to be moderating a few panels as part of the Smart Contract Research, or the Smart Contract Summit, excuse me. Uh, to get us started, I'll just go around with our panelists and ask them to do some introductions. So Andrew, do you mind kicking us off there? Sure. Thanks, Eugene. Very happy to, to get started. So I'm Andrew Miller. I'm an assistant professor in computer engineering at the University of Illinois. Uh, I, there I lead the decentralized systems lab and my research mainly focuses on uh, cryptography, programming languages, uh, and blockchain designs, a lot of smart contract programming, and so the very technical side of cryptocurrencies. Uh, I've been in the blockchain space for about nine years. Uh, I was in, I think, the first cohort of folks who did uh, PhD dissertations focused on cryptocurrencies. Uh, all that is to say, I think I have a good grasp on the technical side of uh, blockchains and maybe on the cryptocurrency ecosystems view of uh, narratives and how finance works. Um, but I'm very new to basically learning anything about how mainstream finance or central banks or you know, real world banks work. Uh, I think that I'm on this panel because I co-authored with some other folks at the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Contracts, a paper on design choices for CBDCs. Um, I mostly have some perspective on what kinds of programming interfaces CBDCs might have and what kinds of privacy issues and techniques that they would have. Um, and, and interested in learning and some much weaker perspectives, I would say, on um, the, the kind of institutional and organizational and policy, policy issues of CBDCs. Um, I think you asked to give a, an, an explanation of what is a CBDC as a short one in this first uh, pass. Um, so to me, the developer's perspective or the blockchain perspective, I think has to be pretty loose. So I would call it a CBDC, whether it has um, just as really centrally operated and directly retail customers to a central bank or something that's more hierarchical with member banks and commercial banks involved. Uh, in either way, to me, what makes it a CBDC is if it incorporates any kind of blockchain technology, whether it's cryptography to provide privacy, uh, smart contract programming to provide extensibility. And what I kind of expect is likely to emerge as, as the real promising uh, pattern is the idea of the central bank providing an API platform for programming with some kinds of rules or regulations or constraints built in at the platform level, but then a very high amount of flexibility for commercial banks and member banks to be able to customize their own applications through this programming interface. Um, and then compete on the kind of functionality that they could offer. So it's really the CBDC as a platform kind of view. So I'll, I'll yield there. Thank you, Andrew. Ariel, do you mind going next? Sure, thanks, Eugene. Uh, my name is Ariel Zetland Jones. I'm an economist at the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I, my research focuses on how information and technology shape financial markets and the implications of financial markets and financial market regulation for the broader macro economy. Uh, lately, I've been studying uh, the role of blockchain in disrupting financial markets uh, and thinking about what economics can shed light on for kind of blockchain and, and the computer science aspects. So thinking about how to harness economic incentives to improve consensus on distributed ledgers or how to use economic incentives to improve, in theory, to improve, say, the design of stable coins. Um, with a training in macroeconomics and monetary economics, I've thought a lot about uh, the role uh, of government and private payment systems in the macro economy. And so the perspective I'll try to add is kind of the interaction between, you know, what monetary policy and central bank digital currency may or may not achieve in, in changing our payment system. Uh, I guess I, I have a very similar perspective to Andrew in terms of what a central bank digital currency may be. I think the critical distinction is whether we think a central bank digital currency is going to be only accessible by financial institutions or accessible to retail customers. And I think the most interesting aspects, as Andrew suggested, is that it, I, what's new about CBDC is offering uh, access to, say, a savings account at the central bank uh, for retail customers. And whether that's an account-based system or a token-based system are interesting questions. But I think that's the newest aspect of a central bank digital currency. And then the question is, how will this impact our payment system? How will this impact the traditional banking system? Uh, in good ways or bad, and what does it imply for monetary policy? And so those are, I think, all, all interesting questions to start thinking about. Great. Thank you, Ariel. And Philip, do you mind jumping in next? 
Thanks. Yes, uh, my name is Philip Sandner. I'm uh, working at the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management, which is a small university in uh, Germany. Uh, not everybody might know this university. As I said, it's a small one. We have 400 business faculties over here in Germany, and uh, the Frankfurt School belongs to, to the top 10 over there. So people over here know it, but it's a tiny one. Therefore, not everybody out there might know our university. I myself um, am into uh, blockchain now since 2013 when I discovered Bitcoin, uh, which became some kind of hobby in the beginning. And uh, five years ago, we have set up the blockchain center at the Frankfurt School. And since then, uh, we are doing um, with our team of 10 people uh, full time uh, blockchain crypto DLT. But we also moved away from enterprise solutions towards decentral systems, cryptocurrencies. That's that's where my heart lies nowadays with on chain analytics and so on. And an interesting topic uh, we are currently investigating uh, is what kind of tokens are out there. You have utility tokens, payment tokens, uh, investment tokens, these tokens, that tokens, and uh, bringing some kind of structure there is one of our mission uh, in our research. And historically, I uh, studied a mixture between business and computer science. And uh, from a research perspective, I did a lot of work in the area of entrepreneurship and also uh, venture capital, uh, always uh, with empirical um, data. And now concerning um, CBDC, um, I think I, I would follow your explanation and your definition. Definitely, I would def try to define um, CBDC as some kind of, let's call it, digital modern ledger um, where you uh, where a central bank tries uh, to re-establish the direct relation to a customer. It can be mediated uh, through financial intermediaries such as banks or payment providers, but not necessarily. And uh, absolutely right, CBDCs can be DLT-based, but they do not have to be DLT-based. They can have smart contracts, but they do not have to have a smart contract uh, functionality. And therefore, um, um, there are good reasons why blockchain technology makes sense. But um, central banks around the world are also experimenting with non-blockchain uh, CBDCs. And therefore, I think my perspective is that CBDC is only one sort of digital money of the future. There will be other sorts of money. Some of them will be fiat based. Some of money will be not uh, fiat based. And for example, in Germany, we uh, discuss it a lot, uh, how, for example, to leverage blockchain and the euro in smart contracts, how to leverage the euro in smart contracts as soon as possible, because the ECB, yes, tries to build a CBDC, but the ECB is lacking uh, quite strongly behind uh, in, when you compare it to China and the CBD, the CBDC um, um, produced by the European Central Bank might be with us by 2026 or 2028. And uh, this is opposed by the European industry, companies like Daimler, Bosch, Siemens, who are urgently demanding a digital currency. So there needs to be other forms of the digital euro uh, for these years uh, because the CBDC is a uh, big project and apparently the ECB um, is not the fastest organization out there. Great. Thank you for the three of you introducing yourselves. And we also have Richard Brown joining us, who's the, the founder of SCURF as well. Rich, if you want to just give a quick intro to. Sure. I'll make this super brief. Um, Richard Brown, uh, co-founder of SCURF, uh, most recently uh, head of community at MakerDAO. Um, if I have any experience that's relevant to this conversation, it is that we produced a stable coin and, and there's some obvious similarities between that and some of the proposals for CBDCs. I'll be co-moderating with Eugene um, and uh, as I'm a neophyte in the, in the space, I'm looking forward to the conversation, but I don't think I'll have much to add, but I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Eugene. And so to get us started, I kind of want to follow up on the the kind of definitions that you all laid out and, and zooming in on that idea for a moment because i think trying to create a baseline of sort of what is a cbdc in relation to does it need to be using a dlt or smart contracts or some of these other you know blockchain uh, technical components or not and really thinking i know philip you also mentioned the idea of hybrid cbdcs uh, when we were getting off uh when we were getting started at, at, at the beginning of this so i guess as an immediate question, Philip, do you mind just mentioning what you mean by hybrid CBDCs, what those are, and then we'll kind of springboard into what we see as the, the minimum design requirements for something to be a CBDC versus another type of tool that central banks might be able to have at their disposal? 
Yeah, exactly. So uh, there are multiple design options out there for CBDCs. Um, um, typically, you call it direct CBDC if uh, we as uh, citizens have direct access to the uh, central bank, but this would require the central bank to really um, do IT. It also would require the central bank potentially to run an online uh, app, like an, a smartphone app, uh, to give me access uh, to the euro or the US dollar. And I think um, central banks are uh, not the right uh, organizations to supply such such IT. Therefore, uh, the topic of hybrid uh, CBDCs popped up. This means that the central bank is supplying the money originally, but it also relies on existing banks and payment providers to process these payments, to also onboard customers to do KYC processes and AML checks. So this, uh, this way you have a multi-tier uh, system with the uh, central bank in the background and some banks and payment processes in between. And the most important point here is that the central bank is supplying the money originally with inflation, without inflation, it doesn't matter, but it's supplying the money and the money can then be taken up by banks and be forwarded to us as citizens, but also to companies and so on. And most important on this point is that there are also uh, payment processes such as credit cards and banks who are then themselves supplying citizens and who are also supplying companies uh, like Bosch, Daimler, Siemens, you know, all these companies, they also need uh, cash for their payments. And here, I think it's very important that the central bank is, is not necessarily always bridging uh, the, uh, the entire line from a central bank to the citizens, but that it supplies money, which can also then be used by other payment processes who then themselves make money available to the capital market, to the industry, to the upcoming economy of things, and so on, and that's that's why I, I that's why the, the the topic of hybrid CBDCs could potentially make sense. And the last point I would like uh, to make in Germany, uh, we we have this discussion uh, going up up uh, on how uh, what we can do to to, to supply uh, companies with some kind of digital currency with a digital euro. And uh, here, for example, banks are developing so payment adapters which are sitting in between their legacy payment systems and smart contract systems and they are reconciling this uh, blockchain. They are trying to reconcile the blockchain system and the balances there with the money in legacy payment infrastructures in the bank accounts. And these payment adapters are then trying to synchronize the legacy world with the modern blockchain based payment infrastructures. Great. Ariel, did you want to jump in? I do. I, I just really appreciate Philip's perspective about this possibility of a hybrid system. And I think it's important to recognize we sort of live in that system already, at least in most advanced economies, right? Where central banks provide physical currency that are used directly by retail customers, but they also provide reserves indirectly to the commercial banking system, who then supply their own form of private money supported by those reserves to private mm -hmm. customers. And I think what Philip's describing is that the role of these banks may look very different when the central bank issues its own digital medium of exchange uh, that is in principle accessible by customers, that maybe they're platform providers of some way to give a better IT experience, better access to, to central bank currency than, than just creating their own private monies. And I think that tension is an interesting one. And I think the big challenge from a central banking perspective of thinking about creating a digital currency is exactly the fact that right now, the intermediaries play two different roles. They're, they're payment processors, but they're also the people who extend credit, the institutions responsible for extending credit. And so, you know, the big debate in, in the economics literature right now about CBDC has really been focusing on disintermediation. The idea that if you give retail customers direct access to the central bank to, to store their savings, will they no longer save in the commercial banking system? And I think that's why in advanced economies, you're seeing a push for some kind of hybrid approach to make sure that we can leave resources in the banking sector to keep extending credit. Because I don't think central banks are interested in using these deposit reserves to extend credit themselves. Um, and so that's why I think Philip's perspective is a very interesting and useful one. The question is just, will the role of these intermediaries change if we create this new kind of digital medium? Yeah, of course. And Andrew, did you want to jump in here as well? Yeah, so I, I like the kind of framing of your question as what would be a minimum viable uh, CBDC or what's the minimum amount of blockchain technology that could be added to it and still call it um, you know, something blockchain based or a digital currency. 
Um, and so, I mean, one thing that I would you know mention is that I, I think it's unlikely that you would have CBDCs built on top of a public blockchain, for example, or built on top of proof of work, uh, you know, anonymous consensus systems, for example. Um, quite more plausible that it would be some sort of consortium consensus protocol or even something that doesn't even resemble a consensus protocol and is essentially centrally operated and looks a lot like an ordinary database system. Um, I could give some examples of potential technical crypto benefits that you might get even in an essentially centrally administered um, database that I think still are very much kind of a um, you know, responsive to the things that are desirable about uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain. So the example that I will give is um, uh, the idea of auditability and um, uh, transparency for records. So to the extent that people are interested in being able to audit uh, from a public viewpoint, otherwise um, opaque systems of um, uh, you know, how much money is being printed or how it's going around, um, some of the kind of technical toolkits in blockchains like hash-based data structures and uh, commitments, for example, um, could be used to essentially make a public account record of uh, you know, all of the main mov movements or uh, changes to parameters or changes to interest rates or other kinds of things that might change over time. Um, and some of the technology that, that uh, blockchains you know, use today in the cryptocurrency world, like zero-knowledge proofs, uh, could be a really good fit for that as well. Like you might be able to provide a very good uh, open transparency record that's essentially a proof that a certain policy has been abided by the central bank or by the member banks. You'd get some cryptographic proof that the rules that were set were followed to a T. Um, and that's something that's new. I think right now in, in an opaque central database system, all you can do is take the administrator's word for it. Cryptocurrencies show that there are you know, some alternative approaches that could be better than that. So even in a world where it's low, you know, to say nothing of the programmability frameworks like smart contracts or of the distributed trust like consensus protocols, even if nothing else, I could imagine CBDCs incorporate some of the uh, cryptography components that blockchains use for better auditability. Yeah, and I appreciate what, what was mentioned so far, especially in terms of many of the conversations from pure, uh, you know, DeFi protocols or anyone that's purely in the blockchain space is just dis disintermediating the existing financial system. But then if a central bank deploys this technology, there's the added tension of, well, how do we actually keep the stakeholders in the loop and as part of this new future and not disintermediate them away? So that was just an interesting uh, thread that, I, that that was mentioned there. But uh, Rich, did you want to jump in and, and mention something? Sure. There's there's some interesting things to unpack here. So it's the, the blockchain space sort of disintermediates and then the banks or central banks issue uh, CBDCs and then they re-intermediate themselves. Um, and, but it, the, the distinction that DLT is not a given, uh, it's more of the paradigm and the assumptions that come along with this new sort of blockchain world that we live in that the banks are now competing against the private sector, which is offering programmability and uh, greater audit trails and perhaps more responsiveness to transactions. So it's the, the banks waking up to this new world that there's expectations that they will provide platforms. And so does that turn traditional banking into more of a, a fintech model where the, the banks or the settlement layers or the issue, the token minters and normal banks that we're familiar with become fintech platforms? Is that the, the new world that we're looking at? Philip, I know you had your hand raised. I don't know if you want to respond to that one or, or follow up on a previous thread. Uh, well, I think that's a very, very interesting thought. I, uh, like doing a finance platform uh, and basically providing uh, access to money could also be other monies. You know, it just doesn't need to be one currency. It can also be uh, foreign currencies and so on. Makes extremely much sense for a bank. And I think the uh, the governments um, around the world they will always want to have um, organizations in place such as banks who are doing um, identification of customers, who, who are doing AML checks and so on. And um, I think if you are seeing a world where governments are requiring this, somebody has to do it. And uh, I think this is a task which is basically, as in the past, also loaded uh, onto uh, existing financial intermediaries, even if potentially in the future you are taking the possibility of providing loans away uh, from banks. Yeah, but but I would like to add uh, one more point uh, to what Andrew uh, has said. Um, I think 
um, one of the very interesting point of blockchain technology, which very often is not really understood, is that you have one ledger and you have multiple assets on top of the ledger. You see this very nicely happening in the Ethereum world with DeFi, right? But in case we are talking about money and as central banks of the past, then the ECB and the Fed and other central banks around, they are simply operating their silo and they don't really care what's happening with the euro or to the euro or with the US dollar. So they are simply supplying the euro or the dollar um, and that's their silo, right? But in uh, but if you are doing transactions, you know, security transactions in the capital market, in case you're purchasing a product or a service from an industrial corporation, then you are giving money and you're taking something. So there is an there is a give and take taking place. And this give and take in the capital market is operated by clearing houses, right? And once you have a uh, blockchain system, which is token based, and you can have the euro, the dollar, securities and other forms of assets on top of one and the same platform, then you can get um, rid of clearing houses because the clearing house function is then done and executed by smart contracts. That's exactly why DeFi works so extremely well because you don't have clearing houses in forms of organizations doing this, but you simply have smart contracts. And this is an angle in my mind where blockchain technology for CBDCs really, really makes sense. But central banks around the world have to accept that they in the future not simply operate their silo of money, but they are deploying some kind of currency on one ledger where potentially there could be other assets as well, because only if you have a multi-asset platform, then you can leverage smart contracts, settlement by smart contracts, and then you can get rid of clearing houses with all the efficiencies and costs and time and insurances and risks and so on, which you then do not have anymore once uh, clearing houses are not needed anymore. I think that's a very important point, which is very often um, yeah, not fully understood. Yeah, and that also generally makes me wonder about the importance of how much pre-planning and standardization needs to be done to enable interoperability on a global scale versus how much, as with many crypto projects, of we'll build first and figure out the details later around some of these things. But Ariel, I know you, you wanted to, to jump in. Well, I, I just wanted to raise that there, there are risks of interoperability uh, across, across currencies and, and making currencies very easily tradable on the exact same platform jointly with say goods or services capital being traded uh, creates risks for independent control of monetary policy and so we can see resistance to this usage as philip's describing of a central bank digital currency where you're creating a single platform uh, and there's some academic research already showing this of what what do global digital currencies imply for risk of independent monetary policy I did want to follow up on one of Andrew's points, though, about using the, the underlying technology features of blockchain in a CBDC, perhaps in a centralized ledger way. And what I thought was fascinating of Andrew's perspective is that CBDC could be used as a way to gain transparency into monetary policy. Um, the flip side perspective is the ability of a central bank to gain more transparency into the use of its money uh, by its retail customers. And that creates an interesting tension of where is the real value in additional information? Is the additional information getting transparency in what, what the central bank is doing in terms of monetary policy or gaining information into how users use currency? And we've seen this in, in private institutions already. We've seen innovations in the private payment space, say Venmo trying to gain more information, more data about its users' transaction records, thinking that data is valuable. So I wonder if CBDC could also offer some value in terms of generating more data about how customers use a given currency and whether that would improve monetary policy or not. The tension there, of course, is perhaps con consumers, retail customers don't want to give all that data away to their government. Certainly in the private digital currency space, that's one of the big concerns of why, why we want cryptocurrencies, perhaps, uh, as opposed to central bank currencies. Um, so I think that creates an interesting tension about how do we design central bank digital currencies in a, in a useful way that will actually be adopted uh, privately. Rich, and did you want to jump in? Well, yeah, you, or you touched on three things, which I think are, are critical. Um, and it's something I've been thinking about as well is that there, in the traditional financial world, there's checks and balances, there's regulations, there's committees, there's meetings and all the rest of it. And that creates a certain pace of innovation, a, a certain buffer exists there where uh, actually if something's going horribly, horribly wrong, people can see that train coming at them very slowly, presumably and take steps to correct those systems. Um, if we 
are we moving into a world where those risks are potentially accelerated? So does the CBDC allow these central banks to uh, get access to that data that you talked about um, and then potentially start doing some A-B tests and doing some tweaks and then handing things over to smart contracts? And then uh, we, we potentially begin to face these risks where rapid experimentation or maybe even real time or near to real time monetary policy gets implemented. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Does this group have any ideas about that? Uh, I, I view it as we usually think more information is a good thing. Hmm. So, you know, in, in today's world, uh, especially in the U.S., we're seeing this advanced uh, you know, opening of the macro economy and we're seeing lots of choke points in different consumer goods. And that's leading to very confusing perspectives on what's happening to overall prices, which is the key objective of the central bank. Uh, one of their two key objectives is to manage overall prices. Would having big data on a CBDC improve that in some meaningful way or not? Uh, I think that's the perspective I was trying to ask, you know, question that perhaps the CBDC gives them more information. Does it come with other costs? And one of the costs, you know, there's a very old debate about kind of discretion versus commitment in monetary policy. And, and Andrew is saying, perhaps we want to tie the central bank's hands, tie them to the mass to pursue their policy, but maybe that's costly because it doesn't let them react in the, the ways where discretion could be valuable. So I, I don't have concrete answers, Richard, for you, but I think that's, sort of the tension I was trying to get at. So I think there's a very big risk of privacy falling to the wayside. And um, so I want to try to give a, a perspective here that really comes from, um, uh, we, we worked through some of this in that CBDZ design choices paper. And really the insight is just to recognize how uh, open-ended the design space is. Um, the, the the scope of what you can do in terms of defining monetary policy and defining your disclosure or privacy rules um nothing is baked in from scratch like you, you with a clean slate design you aren't constrained really in any way what, what you can do with the blockchain technology is, is quite flexible i think that a lot of privacy mechanisms that we have even checks and balances in privacy today aren't the result of design. They're kind of happen by happenstance or come from like the legacy institutional, um, you know, separate silos. You see this not only in finance, but in things like fingerprint databases, where just by having evolved separately, different government agencies, for example, don't have compatible database formats. And that translates into a sort of firewalling, um, you know, privacy mechanism, even though it wasn't designed that way on purpose, it just kind of happened that way. And so I think that there's a risk of assuming that privacy will work well in the future in a CBDC, even if it's not designed for it in the same way that some of today's institutions provide privacy by accident. And I think that that's not, not the case at all. I think that if there's not a policy choice that says that privacy is a first class uh, requirement, our human rights require it, our you know, statutes or whatever requirement, and, and, and so that must be built in. Uh, I think that there's a, a risk of, by default, all the data will be available uh, for, you know, ease of visibility, which has, you know, great benefits of efficiency, but also, uh, you know, potentially bigger risk of data breach and all of that. So my, my hope with CBDCs is that they do incorporate uh, privacy as a first class design goal and then, you know, select from all of the appropriate technologies from zero knowledge proofs and other cryptography that might be employed to uh, ensure that kind of privacy. Um, but it's not something that should be taken for granted. It's not something that's like built into blockchains, for example, quite the opposite. If you use an off the shelf blockchain, it's probably going to involve replication of all of the data, which is, you know, worse for confidentiality or risk of data breaches. And so I wanted to, to follow a thread that started getting alluded to in the last couple of comments. And part of that is exploring the question of what problem are CBDs looking to solve? Because also to think about, Andrew, as you're alluding to the important design considerations, uh, and I, I personally very much agree with the privacy one. And I know I maybe if we have time, Philip maybe can maybe give us some color on the, the EU-based projects with the ECB and how they're thinking about some things. But I guess to start off, what do you think is the core problem that something like CBDCs are solving? Uh, and, and on the back of that, uh, what, what are the important things to keep in mind to make sure missteps aren't taken with a new technology experimented for, for, uh, for those use cases? 
for you? Well, I, I can speak to what people are proposing. And, and I do think there is a tension that you know, our current payment system does not work perfectly. Uh, international remittances are very expensive. There are lots of unbanked individuals and households, say, even in advanced economies like the U.S. And so I think there's a perspective that somehow CBDC might be a solution to that. There's a slightly more cynical take, which is that there's a, a role to preserve monetary sovereignty, that if a Facebook creates a digital currency, that could pose a risk to, the, say, the Federal Reserve in the U.S.'s ability to manage prices and, and, and employment in the economy. Which of those is the right perspective? I'm less clear about. Um, I do think there's a fundamental kind of challenge in answering your question, Eugene, which is if we believe there's this demand for private digital currencies, that's one thing a central bank can't compete with, right? If the goal is I want a currency that's not issued by a central bank, then creating a central bank digital currency is not going to resolve that problem, right? The way to resolve that problem is through traditional regulation, basically ban owning these currencies. And so I think we need to get at a core source of what is the demand for digital currency, private or, or central. And, and Philip alluded to in the EU case, especially on the business side, why there's demand for new types of central bank digital currency that is not just we want something not issued by the central bank. And so I think you have to, you have to resolve that issue in some way. So I'm curious to hear what Philip thinks. Yeah, uh, interesting perspective. And I, I also agree. I would like to add two more points uh, here. Um, I think I think there is some kind of international uh, contest uh, going on between regions, between countries. And I think there is uh, some kind of uh, contest uh, co or competition going on between uh, potential other forms of money, monies, potentially uh, also including Bitcoin, right? We see this happening in El Salvador, right? So there is some kind of competitive pressure. And I think central banks um, have had the monopoly for uh, issuing money and controlling monetary policy for quite some decades. And this is now being contested, uh, I would say so, by uh, Facebook's uh, Project Libra, by um, Chinese uh, central bank, which is really pushing these topics now since here. They're basically launching next year, apparently. Then we have potential um, competition uh, coming from decentral uh, currencies. That's the case of El Salvador with Bitcoin. And therefore, I think central banks now find suddenly in a space where they where they feel uh, maybe they don't know it yet. Maybe we all don't know it yet. But there is a feeling out there uh, that in the future payment might be uh, different because at the end of the day, we as citizens would like to somehow keep our purchasing power. I can I can store gold, I can store euro, I can store dollars with francs or Bitcoin. At the end of the day, I don't really mind, uh, but I would like to be able to purchase my uh, my daily food and my rent, and I would like to keep my uh, purchasing power for the future. And in case central banks cannot deliver this in the future, then I think there is the let's call it threat, but it could also be a chance uh, that citizens are turning away from this and i think uh, we should uh, we should keep this kind of competition or contest um, uh, in mind uh, which is in my mind now starting and this contest could go on for the next years or maybe even decades and another point i would like to make is the following uh, with uh, cbdc's and now i'm uh, referencing the the chinese version um, they are now trying to build a, a solution where you can transfer the money um, across cities persons even across countries within a couple of milliseconds right so given the speed of the transaction is some kind of competitive um, relevant um, metric then suddenly uh, for example take an international corporation such as Siemens, maybe Siemens chooses to onboard to the uh, Siemens as a German company, uh, chooses to onboard to the Chinese system because then they can transact money around the world within a couple of milliseconds, whereas they cannot do it in Euro, for example. So the competitive pressure of the performance of payment infrastructures can also drive central banks uh, to move towards CBDCs. And another facet uh, here would be uh, programmability. In case one central bank or one currency is providing pro programmability for um, financial constructs in capital markets or for um, devices in the economy of things, in case companies are demanding this programmability, then they would like to have it. And in case, for example, the ECB is not providing this, then they turn towards programmable stable coins 
or towards the programmable US dollar or to whatever currency out there because they might want to have the programmability because suddenly the programmability becomes uh, one performance criteria um, where, a, where a currency and a central bank has to perform and deliver. And therefore, I think this is this is this could be a, a new area of co competition which is going on. And we see this uh, with uh, with the uh, with Facebook's project Libra or DM. Actually, nothing happened here, right? They have an, a technical infrastructure in place. They have done a hell lot of PR and work uh, uh, white papers. But at the end of the day, up until now, in the last 2.5 years, not much happened in terms of real action and real solutions, right? But but still, central banks are really kind of upset. They are now really investigating this topic. And that, in my mind, has been driven by uh, Facebook's project 2.5 years ago. Yeah, it's really interesting to think how those competitive pressures might be getting more groups uh, to, to be thinking of this and then, you know, directly them having a problem to solve that, that this is the best solution for. But Rich, I know, I know you, uh, you wanted to jump in. Sure, I think that, Philip, you've identified something here that clarifies it for me is that we, we're dealing with different groups of stakeholders. So we have the state, we have industry, and we have retail, and they're going to come at this with different requirements. Um, that potentially are challenging. And when it comes to proponents of CBDCs, the state or the central banks, there are certain narratives that uh, it feels like they're, they're narrowing in on and, and they can be, uh, the, the, they run a spectrum. So we've seen, um, well, the, just this morning, uh, Elizabeth Warren said that cryptocurrencies, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase here, are run by shadowy super, shadowy cabal of super coders and miners and that's that's bad um and so therefore cbdc's can fix that problem um the other narrative that that seems to be testing the waters with is inclusion and that's been sort of this uh byline of of crypto from the earliest days is banking this notion of banking the unbanked and it, there's maybe a certain irony here that the the banks are not talking about banking the unbanked that they didn't bank in the first place but is is that a compelling narrative does this group think that uh inclusion is potentially one of the the benefits of a, of a cbdc is there a likelihood that more people will get bank accounts in this new world I, I want to i think i have an answer to that i want to build on the um and a comment about where programmability fits into, um, you know, CBDCs. I, I mean, I think that the, you know, structure of central banks is quite interesting. I mean, when I was getting into how cryptocurrencies work and then learned about finance just by some, you know, low quality YouTube videos, it was very simplistic, like central banks are just central. Um, but there's really a lot more to it. I mean, they actually are kind of closer to DAOs, the way they're organized. Like there is a central bank organization, but, you know, member banks and commercial banks as part of them have a lot of sway. So it's a lot more nuanced and, you know, complicated than that. And what I think this fits into is, um, you know, I, I think that there is room for a really nice design of um, what I think would be called a hybrid uh, CBDC, where, um, I mean, this is kind of just expanding on this notion of CBDC as a platform. Like I can imagine that um, the the central bank would essentially act as a platform and set some bare operating rules, maybe some system invariance, like no, you know, no programming error for an application will be able to inflate in an unbounded way the base currency that the central bank is supposed to be managing. Um, but in much the same way, like in the Ethereum blockchain, the you know rules of not printing more Ethereum are it, no EVM smart contract you could write can inflate the amount of Ethereum currency. It's built like that is an invariant built and maintained at the platform level. So I could imagine that the central bank would define some base rules like that, possibly for safety, possibly for regulation, possibly for base monetary policy. Um, but then what, what a programming smart contract interface could do is leave it up to the member banks to be really flexible in terms of what kinds of extra functionality they define or monetary policy for their own tokens that are backed in some way by the central bank's um, uh, base layer money. Uh, there's really quite a lot of you know flexibility that's available there. Um, so I kind of imagine that that may shape out into the the, the role that this plays, where the the member banks are responsible for the innovating 
and that takes place in a programming layer of the infrastructure, the central bank is responsible for setting safety rules or regulatability rules or even just fair play rules and that those would be you know, for, uh, enforced at, at the protocol level. So, I mean, that seems to me to be the most, um, well, I don't want to say I could guess that that's the most likely, but somehow that structure just appeals to me and, and kind of makes sense. Yeah, and I know we're getting close to time, so I'm going to let Ariel respond and then just ask a final question before we wrap up. So I also want to follow up on Richard's point question, which is, and if we look at uh, experience in monetary policy, so where where a digital currency has been extremely successful, say in an emerging market like Kenya with M-Pesa, was it was a digital currency filling a role where there was a lack of institutions and infrastructure for doing payment services, especially not within a village, but across villages or across the country. There we saw a lot of success, and it, I think it was natural that came out of a private company, right, the cell phone providers, because they had established the technology to allow for these transfers. So it didn't quite make sense for the government to take on this new role of creating a whole new infrastructure to allow people to do better payment services. I think it's a very different question when we look at financial inclusion, say, in an advanced economy like the US, right? We have to really have a deeper understanding of why we have you know, a, a, large, a large group of unbanked people in the US, right? If, if they're unbanked because they don't want any records of themselves, then we have to ask, and, and this goes back to Andrew's earlier point, right? What are the right design choices of a CBDC? And is that consistent with the US government's willingness to create totally private currency? You know, you hear a lot of this, uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen said this early on in her tenure recently that I don't like digital, I don't like cryptocurrency because it seems only used for nefarious purposes. And, and you paraphrasing, and you sort of ask, well, how do you feel about cash then? Um, because that seems to be the predominant use of physical currency these days also. So I wonder about this tension of what is the U.S. willing to do in terms of a regulatory anti-money laundering, uh, know your customer protocol for a central bank digital currency, and will that provide the privacy and security that the unbanked may want if that's the reason they're unbanked? So without a real, you know, again, in emerging economies, I understand why folks are unbanked, right? The infrastructure and institutions are not there. In advanced economies, I think it's much less clear. And so when you ask why is the, you know, the Eurozone or the US creating CBDC for financial inclusion, I think it's a much harder case to make. Um, so I'll stop there to leave us time for a last question. And I, I just wanted to follow up with, I mean, just building on a, a number of statements that all of you have made, given kind of some of the current pressures that are in existence for a variety of reasons, but there's a bit of this race to roll out a CBDC. You know, some might be, uh, from a certain perspective, potentially vying for, you know, establishing the digital future reserve currency. You know, we, we don't need to speculate on, on the specific impetus, but given all that that has been mentioned in this panel so far from a citizen's perspective what should we be most worried about as central banks rush to figure out these new technologies and potentially deploy them do you, do you have any specific concerns that are top of mind in in your minds as these get rolled out Well, I think privacy is the number one. Uh, privacy, privacy, privacy. We should, as citizens, try to uh, force the institutions uh, to keep uh, privacy. That might not necessarily be for all kinds of transactions, but at, at least, you know, like transactions below a specific threshold should be private. It's the same way as we have uh, paper-based uh, money, uh, which is also private. And the second point is um, monetary pol policy can be can become dangerous because, for example, in Europe, we have negative interest rates, right? So you are putting money on the bank account and one year later, you have less money on the bank account because we have negative interest rates. So negative interest rate can be pushed through much easier with digital infrastructure. And uh, there is also a threat of money which can expire at some point of time so you have to spend it otherwise it's for whatever reason gone like a voucher and uh, there are a couple of design choices where i think we have uh, citizens but also the political parties and those people who are let's call it building or driving or governing the systems uh, you, you should really be warned uh, that we should not have uh, technology which would allow this andrew yeah i, I, I agree with the way that you put that um I, I just think that there will be, my concern is that there may be a tendency to think that because the design includes blockchain in some way that that 
you know, solves the problem of providing privacy for the individuals and accountability for the people running the system, but that's not a built-in guarantee at all. It's entirely possible to design a system that includes blockchain technology, but gets it backward, providing opacity and uh, uh, the ability to delete data or freeze accounts roughly unaccountably for the administrators, and that provides no privacy for the uh, individual users. Uh, so you can't just rely on like technical uh, destiny uh, to assume that that's going to you know carry out the right way. I think it's really important to ensure that the designs that we have from the beginning reflect you know what we should be asking for in terms of uh, rights to the citizens. Thank you. And Ariel, any final words before we uh, before we wrap up? Well, uh, not to sound like the nerdy macroeconomist here, uh, but just to point out everything Philip said, academic economists might say are exactly a good thing. Um, in theory, there's nothing wrong with negative nominal interest rates. A zero lower bound is a constraint on monetary policy. Alleviating that constraint is good. The experience in the Eurozone has not been great. So I, I appreciate Philip's perspective. You know, a, a hot money where you get vouchers that expire can be a very valuable tool, precisely say in the midst of a pandemic. Overall, will that be used correctly by policymakers? We should be worried. So just to be you know, a little concerned that it might enable the, the policy space in good ways. Could it be used in the wrong way? Absolutely. Um, and I, I agree broadly with the point that we need to deeply understand what is the desirable level of privacy um, in developing these digital currencies and our consumers, our retail, our, our citizens getting the, the appropriate mix of privacy and security from, from governments if they're issuing these. So. Great. Well, we really just want to thank you all for taking the time to share your your thoughts, opinions, and, and work today. Uh, for those who want to continue the conversation beyond this single recording, please feel free to check out the Smart Contract Research uh, website, smartcontractresearch.org, uh, where we're going to have a dedicated post to this panel. That post will include more work, uh, links to the work of all of our panelists, uh, how to get in touch, and also some broad information on this topic as a whole. I mean, and there's so much we unfortunately did not have a chance to dig deeper on or, or bring up. So I definitely hope this is the first of many dialogues we'll be having around this topic. And I just want to thank you all again and hope all the listeners have a chance to enjoy the rest of the summit. It's been a blast. Thanks for having us on. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time, everybody. Really Thanks. appreciate it.